Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR, America's Card Room, where we are finally wrapping up the OSS, the biggest online super series of all time but i suspect even more important to many of you if not most of you is that this weekend on sunday at 5 p.m eastern time america's card room is once again giving away an opportunity to participate in the tag team event at the 2023 world series of poker partnering with either TPE founder and head honcho Derek Killingbird Tenbush, or yours truly, a comedian from New York City. (laughs) My name is Clayton Fletcher, and yes, I am in New York, but only for a few more days until I board the plane to begin the latest chapter in my love affair with the World Series of Poker. I want you guys to come and play the tag team event with me, so somebody is going to win an opportunity to choose your partner in the tag team event. And our generous sponsor, ACR, is paying for the buy-in. So if you're going to be in Vegas in the middle of June, play the TPE free roll this weekend on ACR, and you can find yourself bracelet hunting with Derek or me in Vegas in just a few weeks. Further details about this incredible promotion are available via the Tournament Poker Edge Discord, a link to which is located in the description of this podcast. I'm very, very excited to get to Vegas and hopefully meet some of you there. Be sure to say hi if you happen to notice me at your table or anywhere else for that matter. And definitely, if you're looking for something to do the weekend of June 2nd and 3rd, come see me with Jim Jeffries at... The Mirage, June 2nd and 3rd at 10 p.m. Visit jimjefferies.com. All right, guys, let's get into it. I am very excited for Vegas. I can't wait to get on that plane and just get things going. Um, Today, I want to talk about the recent controversy where a player may or may not have been using a solver at the table. Some of you have asked me to weigh in on this, and I'm happy to do so. Now, I think that solvers are a very valuable learning tool. We should be studying solver outputs and solutions that the robots come up with for our various poker decisions away from the table. Uh, There is no rule against using a cell phone or a tablet or a laptop while you play poker, but for many years now, there has been a rule against using poker software, pre-flop charts, things of that nature, while a hand is being played. So while you have your cards, you're not to be doing that. In fact, the rule used to say that your phone has to be off during a hand, which would really eliminate the potential for this sort of thing. But as we know, the USA is a capitalist society. And years ago, when WSOP.com launched, they wanted to encourage players to be essentially multi-tabling by playing in a live bracelet event as well as an online event, perhaps even an online bracelet event, simultaneously. So, And I've seen many players do that. I've done that myself in the past. My results in those cases haven't been very good because my brain gets a little confused about which hand I have on which table. Like, is it the one on my phone or is it the one I actually looked at in real life with my bare hands? So I expect that my results from having tried this in the past will steer me in the right direction. But once in a while, I'm at a table that's just so boring and so slow, I actually do fire up WSOP.com while playing, despite the fact that my expected value in doing so, well, let's just say the evidence suggests it is dubious at best. So I I hope I won't be doing that this year, but just sometimes uh, some of these tables playing with some of you guys are just painfully slow 
as watching two of you stare at each other for more than three minutes per hand is akin to watching paint dry. But the rules are clear. It is not allowed during a hand for you to use a chart or a solver or anything that might help you play. I consider that cheating, and I think most of you probably do as well. Now, if I saw someone consulting a chart while he had cards, I would absolutely tell the dealer that this is going on so that the dealer can hopefully do the right thing about it. As we all know, sometimes in the World Series of Poker, the dealers are not exactly well-trained. And in the case that the dealer did not do anything about the problem, I would ask the dealer to call the floor. And when the floor came over, I would let him or her know what I had seen. And hopefully we can police ourselves and police each other that we keep this issue in check. All right, let's talk about goals. I think right before the World Series of Poker is a great time for me and maybe for all of us to take a peek at the goals that we set for ourselves earlier in the year. Now, many of us around the New Year's Eve holiday do start to think in terms of what we hope to accomplish in the coming new year. I want to look back at what I laid out for myself in the first episode of 2023, uh, in which, by the way, I was joined by TPE head honcho, the aforementioned Mr. Tenbush. So, uh, yeah, in that episode, we laid out some goals for the year, and I wanted to check in with you and myself and just talk about how those goals are going, because many of them will depend on my behavior in the next two months <laughs> in Vegas based on where I am now and where I hope to be by the end of the year. Most of you know that the bulk of the poker that I play in any calendar year is during the World Series of Poker. So before we get there, let's take a peek. Back in January, I said I have goals to play 80 live tournaments and 300 online tournaments this year. Well, in the live area, I know that 80 is a big number and a bit ambitious from me, but, you know, I'm at four right now. <laughs> the only live poker I have played now that May is coming to an end so far has been four little events that I played at the awful Turning Stone Resort in upstate New York in the spring. Just a 5% dent in this goal. I have 95% of the way to go if I'm going to hit that 80. Now, in fairness, I always expect that I'm going to play 30 to 40-ish tournaments during the World Series, so that is supposed to be about half, but I hoped by now to be up to at least 15 or 20. So, yeah, it looks like a hard road ahead if we're going to reach that goal of 80 live tournaments. Now, in contrast, the online goal looks a little too low as I've already reached 211. That's the total where I am right now before the World Series even starts. And I only set out a goal of 300. I think it's just much easier for me these days to take one day and play a bunch of online tournaments, which is what I typically do between 10 and 20 in a given day when I have a day set aside for online poker. And as a result, this year I've been more of a an online player than a live player, and it's not close. I did manage to squeeze in a few cash games on some recent comedy-based road trips, but yeah, if we're just talking tournaments, my live total here at the end of May is four. So yeah, we got work to do, and we're going to put in work, of course, in June and July, not only at the Horseshoe and Paris, but also at the Win and possibly even the Venetian, and who knows where else I might end up. So we're looking good on the online goal, a question mark on the live goal, and I also had a goal of 200 hours of poker study. Now, when I first wrote this goal down, it felt a bit lofty to me. I'll be honest, I didn't really know if I would be able to find 200 hours for poker study, but I'm thrilled to tell you guys, I'm already at 125 hours of study so far this year. I've, I'm about five hours a week on my poker game, 
usually about an hour and a half to two hours at a time, either reviewing Andrew Brokus's amazing book series, Play Optimal Poker, Volume 1 and 2, or, you know, just studying the various videos that we have on TournamentPokerEdge.com and other training sites, YouTube videos, or just reviewing my own hands with the help of a solver away from the table. <laughs> and that apparently needs to be emphasized uh, in this day and age. So I'm happy with my poker study. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to hit that 200-hour goal. Uh, I, I don't expect to be doing a lot of study during the World Series because it's just so intense in terms of playing that I generally don't do a lot of study. Like if you're not ready by the time you get there, you're not going to get ready while you're there. I mean, it can actually screw you up a little bit if you're learning about a new concept while you are in the midst of battle. That's not wise. By the time I get on that plane, my game will be wherever it is. And it will certainly improve just from all the practice and the sheer amount of my attention that poker will have in the coming two month period. So yeah, but the study time is going to stay pretty stagnant in June and July. I also made a goal of 300 hours of live cash. I'm at 35 now and I'll surely hit that number 300. Uh, I usually play between 80 and 150 hours of live cash during the World Series, kind of depending on how many day twos I make. If I bust early, I might take a dinner break and they'll then go jump into a cash game. So those hours will add up rather quickly. Although I hope not too quickly because if I'm making lots of day twos and threes, I'll be more than happy to have those cash game hours stay nice and low. And finally, my last goal that I set for this year is 48 episodes of this particular podcast. And we are ahead of schedule as you are currently listening to the 20th episode of 2023. So we're right on time, guys. It is my pleasure and my honor to bring you this content week in and week out. So today I want to continue our discussion of the 2022 World Series main event. Now, we're still going to be on day four today. There were just so many interesting hands captured by the Poker Go cameras on day four. I know in years past, like by now we'd be close to the final table as the World Series approaches. But in this instance, I just found day four fascinating. A lot of the television coverage centered around a player by the name of Zilong Zhang. Uh, his friends call him Aaron, Aaron Zhang. You may know him as Aaron Zhang. He got a lot of camera time because of his, shall we say, creative, um, unorthodox play. I guess those are the nice, polite words for someone who employs a strategy that is unique unto himself. And we'll get to Mr. Zhang in a minute. But first, I want to talk about a relatively deep stack hand here late on day four. The blinds were 10,000, 20,000, with, of course, a 20,000 big blind ante. And a player named Daniel Rezaei of Austria opens from the hijack with the king of spades, 10 of hearts. He makes it 45,000, so just a tick above the minimum. And he's got a stack of 1.6 million. So 80 big blinds there for our opener. Now this player, they've been showing him a good bit on Poker Go. He is, uh, you know, he's been pretty wild, pretty loose, aggressive, and kind of on that wild side of things. Um, his M, by the way, is 32. And the action folds to the big blind, who is Andrew Barfield from Illinois, USA. And he's got just a little bit more in his stack than Daniel. So he calls from the big blind with a hand that we're not going to reveal off of a stack of 1.7 million. So the guy with 1.6 million from the hijack makes it 45 and the big blind defends, barely having him covered. And now with 120,000 in the pot and the effective stack at this point is Rezaei with 1.5 million for an SPR of right around 12. The flop comes eight of clubs, seven of spades, 
Deuce of Hearts, 8-7 Deuce Rainbow, and Andrew Barfield Checks. So let's talk about the first decision here uh, with Rezai. So he's got the King of Spades, 10 of Hearts on 8-7 Deuce. Uh, this is a spot where many players will see bet. Now, I personally would just check it back. You know, I mean, it's unlikely that this flop hit the range for opening from the hijack position. So we're going to have a lot of, like, what we have. Two over cards, king-10 offsuit, king-queen offsuit, ace-queen suited, ace-king, like all of those kinds of hands. And the defending range for the big blind, according to the solvers, involves a lot of 8-7, 7-9, 10, 8, like all of these kind of hands that really like this flop. So when you see a couple of middle cards, 9s, 8s, 7s, cards like that, you generally don't want to have a high C-bet frequency. Now, if you want to check it back here, and then should the big blind check again on a blank turn, maybe at that point you can take a stab at the pot and usually win it with very little resistance, in my experience. But yeah, I would try for a delayed continuation bet here. Also give yourself a chance to make a pair. So in other words, if I check back here and then the turn comes a king and if Barfield suddenly leads out, I'm a lot more comfortable calling with a pair of kings, a top pair type of hand at that point. The problem is it's just not a great flop for our range overall. And so therefore in Rezaei's shoes, I would be checking behind. Rezaei disagrees, and he puts in a bet, and it's a, a substantial one at that. On this flop, he bets 105000 into the 120000 pot. So this is obviously a very large continuation bet, and if you're going to use this sizing, it needs to be with a low frequency. Now, I don't like it in this case because uh, not only the, the reasons I just mentioned, about the big blind having hit this board a little bit more than we would, but just because with our particular holding, king-10 offsuit, we really need a lot of luck to take the lead if we're behind. So in other words, to make a straight, we need a nine and something else. So two running cards to make a straight, so that's incredibly unlikely. But more subtly, even when we hit a pair of tens, we're not going to love it because a couple of straights get there with that card, Jack-9 and 9-6, both of which should be in the big blind's calling range. Maybe 9-6 only suited, but still, I think you guys get my point. We're really only hoping to hit a king or to just keep barreling with air to over cards. So I don't like betting here. I don't like betting for this sizing. And I would rarely see bet this flop at all, even with pocket aces. So yeah, not a huge fan of this flop bet, and especially the sizing uh, bothers me a lot. And Barfield calls. Now again, I haven't told you what he has yet, but Hero has the king 10 for no pair, no draw. And the turn with 330,000 in the middle comes the tray of hearts. So our board is now eight of clubs, seven of spades, deuce of hearts, tray of hearts, eight, seven, deuce tray with two hearts. And again, Barfield checks. I think this is a great card for us to check back. I mean, it's unlikely to have changed anything. And if a villain calls a large bet on the flop, he is likely to also call another large bet on the turn especially when that turn is as innocuous as this tray of hearts appears to be. Now, it's true we do have the ten of hearts in our hand, which blocks a few backdoor flush draws that villain could have. But still, I think that in light of the fact that he called almost a pot-sized bet on the flop, it is unlikely that the big blind is fooling around. We overpaid for information on the flop and got it. So at least use the information that we overpaid for and check behind. But Rezaei has other plans and again fires big. He bombs it 310 into the 330,000 pot. 
So again, almost a pot size bet on the flop and now almost a pot size bet again on the turn. And Andrew Barfield calls once more. So look, guys, I think at this point, we have to start trying to range our opponent. What kind of hands can check and call two pot size bets on a board of 8-7 deuce tray? I mean, maybe he has a draw, something like 9-6 suited, especially if it's hearts, because now he did pick up that flush draw we mentioned on the turn. He could also have 10-9, but we do block that. He could have 6-5, I suppose, although that hand may have folded to the pot size bet on 4th Street. So we can discount that one just a little bit. Maybe 6-5 of hearts, but that's really only one combination. Otherwise, I think we need to look at the value hands that can call twice. Um, I guess Ace-8 is probably the bottom of that range. Pocket nines, obviously, in there. Eight, seven, probably would have check raised on the flop or the turn. Uh, maybe a set, like three eights, three sevens, just slow playing all the way at this point. Um, certainly possible. Maybe a slow played pair of pocket aces. I mean, the solver wouldn't like it, right? The solver has us always three betting the aces when it's hijack versus big blind. But that doesn't mean players don't do it. I'm just thinking in hero shoes, you know, what can we put this guy on and why are we still betting? I think the bottom of the value range is probably ace eight and balancing that uncapped value range, really just a few draws, mostly combo draws that can handle this kind of pressure. I think it's important to note at this point that if villain has a draw, king high is good. Let's reiterate that for emphasis. If Villain called our pot-sized bet on the turn with a draw, King High is still good at this moment. So keep that in mind, guys, as we go to the river, and now with 950000 in the middle, and Rezai only with $1.1 in the remaining stack, the river comes the jack of clubs for a final board of eight of clubs, seven of spades, deuce of hearts, Tray of hearts, jack of clubs, and Barfield checks once more. So in the shoes of Daniel Rezaei, should we bet again? I think absolutely not because one of the draws came in, 10-9. I know we block it, guys. I know we have king-10, so we block 10-9. But just because we block something doesn't mean that the opponent can't possibly have it. I mean, if we bluff here, we're trying to get him to fold specifically ace eight, maybe pocket nines if pocket nines for some reason didn't three bet before the flop. Otherwise, we're just hoping that the opponent got extremely sticky with a hand like king seven suited for second pair or I don't know. Like, what are we hoping to blow him off of at this point? One of the draws came in and made the nuts. The other draws we are still good against, and I expect to have little or no success getting this player to fold his value because the value range that calls a pot size bet on both the flop and turn should be extremely strong and not interested in folding just because the jack of clubs hits on the end. So I think it's time to finally give up on this one and check behind. Daniel Rezaei instead goes all in, over betting the pot, putting in 1.1 million into the 950,000 pot and gets snap called. And Barfield wins this huge pot with 8 8 for a flopped top set. There's no better feeling in poker than being up against a wild, loose, aggressive player, flopping the nuts, and then checking and calling three huge bets against that player. This hand was fascinating to me because it just shows how relentless some loose aggressive players can be. And loose aggressive players are tough to beat. But, you know, at some point you've got to just go back to the fundamentals. Now, I'm pretty loose and pretty aggressive myself, but I definitely would have shut it down at some point, probably right on the flop, in the shoes of Daniel Rezaei. All right, let's do one more. I mentioned earlier I want to talk about Zilong Aaron Zhang, and he was playing a pretty wild style himself. 
The guy also has a great personality. I mean, they, he's gotten a lot of camera time because he seems very confident and comfortable at the table, but he's also making jokes and smiling and, and kind of enjoying the experience, sort of joking about how the other players hate him because he was winning more than his share of the pots, which you will always do if you play the loose, aggressive style. That's one of the advantages to playing that style. But look, there is a difference between plus EV lag and negative EV lag. So let's kind of make our mind up about this particular hand in which Zilong Zhang will be the villain. So in this hand, we're going to play the role of Dan Smith. That's right, the famous Dan Smith. He of the cowboy hat and multi-millions in tournament earnings over the years, widely regarded as one of the top players on planet Earth. We're still in the 10, 20, 20 level. And a player named Dooley Alshanti with only 440,000 raises from third position. So two folds and then Alshanti opens off a stack of 22 big blinds. Now we talked a couple of weeks ago about a player getting involved with an M around nine or 10 from early position and how theoretically that player should have a range that is heavily weighted towards value. I mean, as your stack gets smaller and smaller, the fewer bluffs you should have and the more willing to get all in pre-flop you should be if you're going to open at all. Now in that hand we talked about a couple weeks ago, the opener was an amateur player who ended up having jack nine, a hand that should absolutely be folded with an M of nine or 10 and when a player is in early position. But you know, you will see amateur players do certain things that we pros would never do, which is part of what makes them amateurs. Uh, anyway, Alshanti is also an amateur. He opens from third position off of 440. He makes it 40. So he's already put in almost 10% of his effective stack. And it folds to a villain, a Zilong Zhang, in the cutoff with 2 million in his stack. So 100 big blinds. And he calls. Now we are Dan Smith on the button holding the king of spades, jack of hearts. And we have the whole table covered with 2.7 million to the surprise of no one. Dan Smith is an absolute crusher with very strong fundamentals and a lot of heart, the ability to make a big bluff at the right time or a big call when necessary. I mean, he's a tough player, someone I would not want to have on my left. What should he do with King Jack in this situation. Uh, maybe I'm too tight, guys, because I would just throw it away. You know, the early position raise, followed by this crazy guy on my right calling. Uh, I don't really like over calling, even on the button with King Jack offsuit. And I don't really like three betting here because again, that early position raiser should probably have a pretty strrong hand that he might be willing to get all in with at which point I'm going to have to fold my King Jack and whatever equity is attached to it when the four bet comes in. So forget all that. Let's just throw this away and play the next one. Obviously, I didn't bring a hand for the podcast <laughs> where the hero folds pre-flop. So Dan Smith decides to call, which I'm sure is defendable. I just don't know how to defend it. The blinds fold, and now three of us will see a flop Hero in position holding the King of Spades, Jack of Hearts. And with 170 in the middle, the flop comes Jack of Diamonds, Nine of Spades, Six of Clubs, Jack, Nine, Six, Rainbow. So we've got top pair and a King kicker. The original Razor, Duli Alshanti of the United Kingdom, checks. And now Zilong Zhang bets. 95,000 with a hand I have not yet revealed. Just over half the pot here with the sizing. What should Dan Smith do with top pair? Uh, well, first off, we have to wonder what Alshanti's up to. What kind of hand did he open for two of his 22 big blinds before the flop and is now checking? Obviously, he could have two big cards like ace king, ace queen and is now giving up with the hope to live to fight another day mentality, which is totally fine when he's got a hand that missed against two 
aggressive opponents, just check and fold is okay with something like Ace King. Those are the kind of hands I would normally put him on in Smith's shoes. But also, you got to remember the most aggressive player at the table, and it's not close, is Zilong Zhang. So it's possible that Al Shanti has a monster, perhaps a hand like Pocket Jacks, and is hoping that Zhang will bet as he always seems to do when he is checked to. So the fact that the original Razor checked doesn't exactly convince me that my King Jack is good. And the fact that Zhang is betting doesn't change anything because that's just what he does, which is kind of why I didn't really want to play this King Jack in the first place. Even when we get such a great flop as this one, we don't really know where we stand. This might just be a fold. I'm not sure, but I think that under these circumstances, the best play for Dan Smith before the flop was to throw the King Jack away. Uh, in this case, I think the best play is probably just to call and see what develops on the turn, which is what Dan Smith does. And then Al Shanti folds. He had pocket sevens, perfectly reasonable on all streets. All right, so the pot is now 360,000. And the turn comes the king of diamonds for a board of jack, nine, six, king with the king and jack of diamonds, hero holding the king of spades, jack of hearts for top two pair. Of course, the queen 10 did come in with this card, but otherwise it's a beautiful sight to see. And Dan Smith gets a check from Aaron Jang and decides to bet 215,000 into the pot of 360,000. So just about two thirds of the pot here, a little less. And how can you blame him, right? I mean, it's, it's top two pair against an aggressive opponent. You gotta love it. At that point, Zhang puts in a check raise to 675,000. Uh, I mean, this is pretty brutal. We're at the, pretty close to the top of our range here with top two pair. And our opponent is wild, loose, and aggressive. He doesn't need to have queen 10 to make this play. Now look, guys, if you decide to enter the $300 Gladiator event this year at the World Series of Poker, and you make a large bet on the turn, and your opponent check raises you, I think you can usually fold top two pair against a field like that. You just don't see very many players at the lower stakes raising large bets on 4th Street without the nuts. You just don't. You really don't. But this guy, Zhang, has been splashing around all day long, and you can't just go around folding top two pair <laughs> versus a player like him. And Dan Smith knows it. After a few seconds, he makes the call. And now we've got a big pot brewing. There's 1.7 in the middle, and Mr. Zhang has only 1.2 million behind Dan Smith with 700,000 more than that. And we're going to the river and it comes the 10 of hearts for a final board of Jack of diamonds, nine of spades, six of clubs, king of diamonds, 10 of hearts, Jack nine, six, king 10. Yes, guys, any queen makes a straight. And now out of nowhere, Zilong Zhang bets 780,000. Having bet the flop, check raised the turn. And now on the river, puts in 780 into the 1.7 million pot and Dan Smith is in the blender. What to do? I mean, you're getting a pretty good price, better than three to one on a call. Top two only needs to be good about 22% of the time here in order to break even by calling with it. But the question just, you know, does this guy have it in him? to check raise the turn and then bet this river. Why isn't he worried that I have a queen? I think this is just a brutal spot for Dan Smith. I can't really beat anything but a bluff. I mean, I'm not even sure that other two pair hands would even bet here, right? 10-9, Jack-9, like these kind of hands, King-9. We can beat them, but I don't know if they're betting here, especially when, if you think about it, Zhang only has 1.2 million in his stack. And he only bets 780. On one level, that makes me think he doesn't have a queen. Why wouldn't he go all in if he had ace queen or queen 10 or any queen for a straight, right? Well, why isn't he just going all in if he really has it? Uh, but some players will try to get that little bit more value by betting less. 
and leaving themselves a little bit more behind in case they lose. I mean, does he really have the audacity to check raise the turn and then bet this river without a queen? Uh, in Smith's shoes, I don't know what I would do. Smith does fold, and he actually blew him off a chop. Zhang also had King Jack. So top pair on the flop, top two pair on the turn, and then no fear when the river came down. Just not worried that Dan Smith had a queen at all. So a pretty wild play by Zilong Aaron Zhang. That happens to work out for him this time, and it really vaulted him into the chip lead at this table where the action remained fast and furious for the remainder of day four. And that'll do it for this episode. Guys, if you haven't yet joined ACR, now's the time. Click the link in the description of this podcast to join. You can get a first-time deposit bonus of 100% all the way up to $2,000 just by using the promo code TPE. And definitely join our Discord and find out how you can play this Sunday, May 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern for a chance to join me as my partner in the WSOP Tag Team event. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, with thanks as always to our very generous sponsor, America's Card Room, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I wanna hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Love it, it's not rough, it isn't fun, fun, oh.